Hello. Hey, everybody. All right, sorry to interrupt all the conversations. So first, I want to thank everyone who is going to sit here and listen to me, and I want to thank the board and everybody for doing this. I think it's an amazing thing, having been most of my life without anybody really caring about the patients too much. So this is really fantastic that we're all here. And I want to say I'm very excited just to see not only Gaucher people, anybody after COVID, because I think the, the only person I spoke to during COVID was that woman trying to sell me the extended warranty on my car. <laughs> and after buying five of them, there's really not much left to say to her. So um, my, my talk is called Being a Patient Patient. I also want to say, when I originally wrote this, I, I sort of thought there would be some more of the industry people here. So I've rewritten a little bit because we're sort of family. We've all gone through a lot of things, so I don't need to explain the things we've gone to to other people. So um, I'm sort of doing this on off the cuff here, even though I have a script. So if I stumble a little bit, that's why. Anyway, patient, patient. I, um, I thought this would be a good term for this because of the word, the word patient. It's... We are all patients because we are sick, but we have had to be patient for so long. I just find it an interesting word that I think really fits Gaucher people. Like I was six years old when I first went to NIH and I gave bone marrow for research. And my, hold on, let me just make sure this is off. Um, my intake number to NIH is about 550. So I was one of the first 600 people at NIH to go. That's how long I have been going, and I was told at that point, be patient. You should be patient, that they will come up with the treatment. And it took 40, well, when I was 43, I finally got to have that treatment. So I am uh, in debt to the taxpayers. I am in debt to all the researchers who sat in their cubicles for years and years. And one of the interesting things whenever I go back, because I'm still doing the studies with Ellen at NIH, is the people at intake are really excited when I get there. You know, every job has its thing where it excites people. And I, when I go to NIH and they go, you're number 560, they get like really excited because now, you know, you go and you're in the millions. So anyway, while I was being patient, this is where it all came from. This is my... My mom, who was Russian, my dad was Polish, my brothers, Doug does not have Gauchets, me in the center, and my brother, Richard, who does or did have Gauchets. And this is us getting our spleens removed the same day at Mount Sinai Hospital uh, in 1964. We, I had one, Richard had one with an auxiliary spleen, they were both taken out. And this is me at the 1964 World's Fair. And this is one of the first times that I ever realized that there was sort of any upside to having Gauchets. And that was because it was the first time we ever got to have disabled parking. Because back then, there was no thing. There were no woke people having disabled parking. And we got to drive into the New York World's Fair, unload right in the front. And that was an amazing thing because there, there weren't signs everywhere yet. And we got to jump line for It's a Small World, which was originally shown at the 1964 World's Fair. So that song has been going around in my head ever since. Um, but anyway, that was the thing. So I started to learn that if you played this game, I mean, we all have to play this game to get insurance, to get treatment, to get people to pay attention to us that I could work sort of an upside to it. And one of those things, parking. The other is I never once had to go to gym class in all of school. I just said my legs hurt, I was sick, I couldn't do it. So I never ever once had to go to gym class. So that was, um, that was a definite upside. Oop. It's not uh, clicking. There we go. 
The other one, this is uh, Ed Cranepole. He was the Mets first baseman uh, on the 1964 Miracle Mets. And at that point, I was in junior high school. And I was in, I was in the hospital, and somehow my parents pulled the I've got a sick kid card, and Ed Cranepole came to the hospital to visit me. And this picture was on the front page of the New York Daily News. So when I went back to school after the summer, I was this sort of junior high school mini momentary celebrity. And it was also the only time in all my years that anybody ever said to me is, I wish I had your disease so I could meet <laughs> Ed Krimpel. Uh Let's see. So anyway, around this time, we, there weren't many people. There, we were told back then there were only about 250 known cases of Gauchets. So it was really hard to get any treatment, and, um, but there was some support. There were starting to be some support groups around New York, and it just happened that my grandfather lived next to a family that had a young girl with Gauchets. And her mom and my mom strategized all the time how to get us the best treatment, and they started looking for doctors. That's how I landed up at NIH when I was very, very young. Um, and also back then, the only place you could really go for any support was March of Dimes. They had sort of jumped from polio to, um, to Gauchet's. So anyway, the, the downside for all this is that that young girl died at about 22. So that was sort of a weird awakening at that point. Even though the doctors had been saying to me, oh, your life expectancy, you know, like a lot of us older patients, we were, you know, we were told if we hit 30, we'd be in uh, having a long life. So she died at 22. So that was a, a shock and sort of a weird thing. And I know Cindy and I talked about this last night. A bunch of us went to dinner last night. And we all had the same experience of, oh, well, we're probably going to die young, so we better have, like, really, I will not say reckless lives, but fun lives. <laughs> um, so a lot of us did that, and then all of a sudden they told us, you know, we had to be responsible when we got older. Um, when I was 25, I went to the first actual patient support group, which was in New York City, which I found really interesting for two reasons. It was uh, the first time I was ever in a room with a bunch of people that all had the same limp that I had. And so that was great. And um, it was also a lot of parents sort of arguing about whose kid was suffering the most. So I thought that was... Um, that's yeah, I know. I know. I, I was going to say, it was, I was in a room full of Jewish limpers, is what I was <laughs> going to say. I'm trying to read the room, so it's... Uh, let's see. Anyway, so I, and when I moved to L.A., a lot of my first friends in L.A. were people uh, that I would meet at patient dinners. We'd give each other support and information. We all complained to each other about our pains, our insurance, our paperwork, and lack of treatment. But we were all very patient patients, and we all helped each other uh, great. So anyway, a lot of... Uh, the community has been really supportive of me, and also a lot of the doctors. So I want to tell you two of my favorite doctor stories um, that are good, not the bad doctor stories, because I have a lot of those, too, when I've dealt with non gauchet doctors. So when I, when I was about seven, this is, this is my favorite one of all, and Cindy will appreciate this one, because Cindy loves cats. Uh, I, I was, my leg was hurting really badly, and I... I with, in my cases, um, my brother was weird. He had muscular complications, whereas I had bone complications. And my knee was swollen. I couldn't bend it. And normally the doctor would come. He'd look at me if I was in severe pain, like any of you older people. You know, it's like, okay, we have to bring him to the hospital, sedate him until the pain goes away. But this one time, the doctor is like, I am going to drive you to the hospital. And I couldn't figure out, like, why does he want to take me to the hospital, because that was always something, you know, in the old days, they would come to your house, they did house calls, but he came in, he picked me up, he put me in the back of his car, and I had to lie down. I remember vinyl seats, because every time he did a turn, I would slide, <laughs> I would slide from one side, and I'd hit my leg on the door, and I'd scream, and so anyway, he, he comes off the main road on the way to the hospital, and he pulls into his own driveway, and he picks me up again, he carries me, and he puts me down on the, the floor, 
next to a box with a cat with six kittens in it. And he said, when you're going to the hospital for a while this time. I was in really bad shape. But by the time you are ready to get out, these kittens are going to be ready to be adopted so you can have a kitten. He had not discussed this with my mother <laughs> on the way. So, so anyway, I go to the hospital. I'm like, I'm going to have a kitten. We're, and my mom, of course, was like, oh, yeah, we'll talk about it. I'm like, no, the doctor said I'm getting a kitten. <laughs> so on the way home, I get the kitten, and we go home. And I've always thought, like, for years, this was, like, the most compassionate thing. And then... It's like when I, I was telling the story to somebody once and I started thinking, maybe this doctor was just like the most conniving doctor ever. And every time one of his kids was sick, he would say, you're getting a kitten when you get out of the hospital as a way to get rid of all his kittens. <laughs> because what mother was going to say to you, I'm sorry, you can't have the kitten when you're in the hospital. So I, and, and the serious one is one time, my brother developed Parkinson's and he was in a nursing home for quite some time. And the last time I saw Pram, I had Pram meet me at the nursing home with my brother, and I was really overwhelmed by it. And Pram came, you guys all know Pram, the, the best doctor in the world, at Dr. Mystery. And he came and he sat down with Richard in the nursing home, and he was feeding him. He sat there feeding him, and like Richard could barely speak, so Pram was sitting there feeding him, and with his ear like right next to Richard's mouth so he could hear him. And the, the compassion of, of Pram is just something every time I think about it, I wasn't even that close with my brother, but I think of Pram and it kind of brings tears to my eyes because this is the kind of people I have met around the Gaucher community and the fact that you guys are trying to bring us all together is really uh, a fantastic thing. Um, I don't know why this is not working. Hold on one second. Okay. So anyway, this is uh, right before we're going to the hospital. This is my dad thinking he's very cute and using iodine and writing cut here on my stomach uh, before I had my spleen out. And this is me in the hospital with all my art supplies. And being in the hospital for me early on was sort of like being in an art studio, I would go all the time, and I think, well, once once the pain disappeared, of course, I'd have a couple days before I went home, and I would draw, and I had a case where, or a situation where the there was a candy striper. They used to call volunteers candy stripers back then, and she came in and saw me, and she just said, you know, if you hate it here, you can do a drawing about the fact you hate it here. And nobody had ever said that to me. Everybody was always like, buck up, deal with it. And this woman said to me, if you hate being sick and you hate being here, draw it. So I started using IV tubes and bandages on my drawings and I'd stick them on. I did drawings about the fact that I hated being in the hospital. So the, the fact that this woman, who was probably 20, this, this once okay to emote about what was going on really changed my whole life. It gave me the freedom to talk about it and be who I landed up being later on. So this is one of the first, I did this for a self-portrait show. And everybody else in the show did like nice portraits and everybody tried to look as good as possible and I did this one because this is how I was feeling. My bones were disintegrating. I, because of the fatigue, I had a really hard time with my job. I used to do graphic design. So this is how I was feeling at the time. And these were done right before I had my hips replaced the first time. And I was, I really felt like I was in a box. I knew one, I don't know if any of you people know Mary Nathan. She lives in, uh, in Washington. She had had a hip replacement and they had given her the wrong blood type. She almost died. They had to pull her hip out. It was a mess and I'm going in and and I just felt trapped by it, I, and that's what I drew. I drew these contorted skeletons, and this is how I was feeling. So, these are the first paintings after the hip replacement. I had just started on enzyme replacement, and the pain was gone for the first time, and I could walk without a limp, which took a while. I don't know if any of you have had 
your hips done here after having a terrible limp. It takes a while to get used to your new body and not having a terrible limp. But anyway, look at the difference. There's other people. It's not just about me. And you know, when you're an artist or you're sick, everybody in here knows it, you're, it takes so much space in your brain to be sick. You think about it so much. So it makes sense that artwork would be about you too. And then once I didn't feel sick, I could start doing work about other things and other people, and it was very, very freeing. So later on, I started doing even more colorful work about being in love and happiness and going to Paris and doing all these things. And so all my work was just very, very fun, and it was all very rewarding, and it sold much better, but it, it really, it wasn't giving me the emotional fulfillment about the work I did about Gauchets. So I was at an art opening once and I was showing all this work that didn't really have much emotional punch to, to it, although it sold. And this woman rolls into the art gallery in a, like a, a low backless dress. And this is before the Iraq war. So we weren't, it's, we, the, as a country, we didn't have the attitude yet of, oh, people with scars are okay, people with prosthetic legs are okay. So the fact that she would show up in Beverly Hills and sort of flaunt this scar was sort of an amazing thing. And we started having this conversation and she really got on my case about the fact I was not doing work about illness anymore. And she kept saying, she kept, she kept calling me a tab, which she was, meant temporarily able-bodied. And she kept saying, you know, you're going to get sick again one day and you've got this in you and you should be doing work about illness. And it, it had the same uh, resonance with me as that candy striper did 30 years before. And those are the two sort of bookends of my life where people said, include the emotional aspect of Gaucher into your work. So I did. And I called her up the next day and I said, I've got nothing left to say about me. I'm healthy for all intents and purposes now, but I want to do something about you, and I want to tell your story, so let's do a print of your scar. And so I showed up at her house with a roller and paper, and I did a print. I put ink on her, and I did a print, and I showed it at an art gallery a couple months later. And I had pe person after person after person come up to me and say, let me tell you about my scar. And they were opening up their shirts and they were pulling down their pants and they were lifting up their skirts and everybody wanted to tell me not only about their scar, but they wanted to tell me about the survival aspect of it. And I, I realized immediately, and especially for us, because as a group we have a lot of scars, that the idea of making it through these things is everybody's biggest challenge. It, sometimes it's more than just having the illness. It's like the treatment is a big deal. And I also sort of came to the conclusion that everybody knows the date they had an operation, the day they had a car accident. But there is no real day when you think that the muscles have knit or the bone is done, or especially when your body is strong enough again that you feel like you're healed. You know, for some of us, after operation, you're 110% of where you were before, and some of us, it's 90. There's no consistency to gauchets for everybody. So anyway, I started thinking the whole aspect, I started thinking about the stories and collecting the stories, and I've done hundreds of these scars now, and I always sit with the people ahead of time, and I listen to their stories, and I'm always amazed by their stories of survival after they land up having their scars. So I'm gonna just quickly go through a couple of these. And, and the thing to remember is that my time in the hospital, being around you guys and everybody else, makes me really empathetic and they all feel that they can tell me their stories. So that's another aspect of how Gaucher has sort of helped my career, and I, and I don't mean this talk to just be like my achievements, but they're all my achievements because I had Gauchets. It's the fact, it's like everyone in this room is who you are because of Gauchets. All this is because I have Gauchets. If not, 
I would have been a graphic designer in a cubicle, and chances are I would have killed myself out of boredom, and I would have died earlier than I would have from a bad case of gauches. So uh, this is a guy who, when he was 19 years old, was playing with fireworks, and he blew his hand off. And when you blow your hand off, so you don't get gangrene while they figure out how to put it back together, they open your stomach, your stomach up and they stick your hand in your stomach so you don't get gangrene. So he walked around for months like this. And whether or not it's true, his family lore is that his mom had mangled her hand up in Germany decades before and that this treatment was designed or developed on his mom. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it's all about the stories. Everyone's got their stories, so that's his family lore. Mom wrecks her hand, son wrecks his hand, and so don't play with fireworks. That's the other. Uh, this is a guy named LaBelle Campbell who got uh, a missile exploded near him in Iraq, and he landed up having 43 operations to rebuild his leg, his eye socket, his arms. So what I, as opposed to Joy, who was the first slide I show you, now I go in and I listen to their stories and I try to put things into the artwork when I do the print of what they did. So this has American flags and little bombs and, and, and things. And this guy's been amazing. He's gone with me to talk to other patient groups and, and things like that. And he's now, um, after being blind and unable to walk for years, now he goes through Europe all off season and takes pictures of basketball teams in Europe and he has this amazing life and he came back and, and uh, got married and has a kid. This is a, a guy who joined, he didn't know what to do with himself and when he was 18 he joined the army and on his 19th birthday uh, a landmine exploded underneath his tank in Iraq. And so that's the tank he was in on the side there. And when the tank got um, hit, it torqued, and to get out of that tank, there's a turret on top, and you need to turn it in the right place so you can get out, and he couldn't get out. So he landed up severely burned and landed up losing his arms. They kept doing amputations, hoping that they would be able to put a prosthetic on him, and they didn't. He's the only one out of this hundred uh, people that I shot with someone else, and I shot him with his daughter because when he came back, his wife had divorced him and tried to take the kids, saying he wasn't fit, and he fought to get his kids, and he has full custody of his kids. Um, this, this is one of my favorite stories. This is, this is a young woman who, like us, had something very weird. She kept getting pain in her pelvis, and she went to the doctor, and the doctor thought, well, maybe it's sciatica, and it kept getting worse, and he asked the insurance company to do an MRI on her so he could figure out what was going on. And if you look, the X is where her tumor was that was inside her pelvis, and on top I've drawn calendars because it was 123 days from the time they first asked the insurance company um, for an okay for the MRI to when they finally okayed it, and during that time the tumor grew, it was a very aggressive tumor. So she went to 14 doctors who told her that she was not going to make it and she should get her affairs in order, which you know for a 17 year old kid is, is pretty um, scary. But she met one doctor and this is a while ago, she, she said, he was like Dr. House, he was gonna fix me. And he said, I can remove half your pelvis but I'm gonna have to take out your leg too because there was no way to cradle the leg anymore. So she went into the hospital, the operation was successful. She got out in time to go to her high school prom with a guy she met in the hospital. She has since gotten married and um, she sued the insurance company and won $25 million. So, so that's had a good end to it for her, except for the leg. And this is my cat. And the cat is here specifically because you guys all went off. And I, and I show this cat whenever I, no, this is a different one. Uh, this, this, this cat was, it was uh, that cat was long gone by the time. Even with nine, I might've gotten it on its ninth, who knows? 
Um, so this cat had obsessive compulsive disorder and it used to scratch its head. And the people who had it before me got it declawed and because it was OCD, it kept licking the wounds and the feet got infected so then they removed the feet and the, he didn't want it. But I always show this picture when I talk to medical students because, and the reaction here is the same one, you just saw a woman who lost her leg, but then when you get to the cat, everyone's like, oh, poor cat. And, and I can really embarrass medical students with that picture. I'm like, so there's a, you guys all should have gone to vet school because you obviously have no compassion for the human that you just <laughs> saw. So um, anyway, that's why the cat is there. But the, uh, anyway, the cat was totally nuts. It had all sorts of neurological problems. I built, yeah, I built ramps, and uh, so. Yeah. All right, so now I run a gallery at USC. So I took all those stories, those hundreds of stories, and remember again, it's all about everything that happened because of Gauthier's. I went to USC. Well, first I went to UCLA for a short time, and then I got poached away from USC. And I run an art project there where they uh, have a gallery in the medical school, and I find artists who do work about the illnesses that are being studied in the core curriculum of the medical school. So if they're studying respiratory illness, I find an artist with cystic fibrosis. If they're studying neurology section of the curriculum, I find someone with Parkinson's or, or whatever, and I give them an exhibit, and we have a conversation in front of the medical school and whoever else wants to come. And I also pair them with the medical specialist. So I make the patients talk about their care and how their illnesses affect their artwork. And I make the doctors look at the artwork and talk about it and whether or not it helps them with understanding the patient experience. And this came to me because when I was like seven or eight and I was in the hospital, I would always go to either Mount Sinai or my local Neurochelle Hospital in New York, and they were both teaching hospitals, and I used to have a flock of interns come in, and they would go, oh, that's a really big spleen, and they would talk about me, but they would never talk to me, and that it just always bugged me. It bugged the hell out of me. So, and as I was getting older, I thought, well, how can I do something about this? It always was in my head. How can I make a difference in medical education, getting these doctors to do things. And through art and my experience of being a lifelong patient, I could approach these big medical schools and start these programs. So anyway, this is a woman, and uh, maybe Wayne can help us here. The, the illness where you get the loose tendons in your hands. Elder, el yeah. So she has that. And when she was young, she was doing these very mediocre still life paintings. And then when her hands got so affected by this illness that she couldn't hold a paintbrush anymore, she started doing these amazing abstracts. They are really incredible. And she does them, you, can, you can't really tell in this one, but the little patterns, they're all genetic things. And she does this amazing work. And she went from being sort of like a, a weekend painter that never got in shows to now being shown by big galleries because, you know, it's hard to tell, but the paint is like this thick because she like scoops it on and just pushes it around. But like my work, and I'm sure some people here, that would have never happened if she hadn't been sick. She would have been doing those crappy uh, still lives. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. This is a guy who worked for Hanna-Barbera and he developed Parkinson's uh, at 56 or 57. So he used, he worked on the Jetsons and he worked on the Flintstones and Yogi Bear. Everything we watched as kids, this guy worked on. But he had never done work about himself or his own situation. And then when he got Parkinson's, he started doing this crazy work of these, mon it's all in the same style. So it's very friendly work, but it's all about him and Parkinson's coming to get him again. He would have never gotten to this point of creativity had it not been for having Parkinson's. Um, this is my favorite of all the patient work I have ever shown. This is my favorite one because any of you who have been in the hospital here, 
you have had this picture in your room. And, and I don't, can't think of a single piece of artwork that captures the patient experience more than this, pitch, this picture because I can think of so many times of a blue one, a green one, or the pink one, depending on which hospital I was in, and friends bringing you flowers in the hospital, and why hospitals do not have pitchers, I don't understand, but they put them in the water, and the flowers are too tall, and the water pitcher tips over, <laughs> and it's a big mess, and it's embarrassing. But anyway, so I just, I love, I absolutely love this picture. It totally, you know, years and years of my life in that, that picture. So this is what I do now at the school. So the, the top one, it's a social worker on the left, a woman in the middle who had a normal pregnancy and then her son landed up being born with severe cerebral palsy. I, don't, I still don't understand exactly what happened uh, during the birth, but something cataclysmic happened. And she came to talk to the med students, not only about her work, she uses all her son's spent medical supplies in her artwork. And she does these huge installations for museums and things. Her work is just beautiful. But she came to talk about a lot of the problems that you parents here who have kids with gauchets have, and us have had to deal with, like how do you get the kid to school? And manage time because you've got other kids who aren't sick while this one's in the hospital. And so we didn't talk about her illness, we talked about time management and finances and how do you get a social worker over to help you if you need. And you know, all this information is going out to med students again because I was sick as a kid. Uh, the one down below is two people who have visual perception differences. The one, the woman, has facial blindness, and the guy being examined by the doctor in the middle of the talk in front of 200 people had had a stroke, and he lost his eyesight in one eye. And he was sort of, you've all heard of phantom limb pain. Well, he has phantom visions. So you can see the artwork behind him. He lands up doing these photo collages so that we can understand what he sees through his eye. And so by doing that, I'm trying to eliminate that idea that patients, can't, the, the interns that go into the rooms will think of their patients as people with fuller lives. I don't want them to look at us and just go, what's your hormone level? How many mutations do you have? What, what drug are you on? I want them to think, well, maybe these people are doing some amazing things because they have this illness. Um, the one on top is, the, again, the guy from, uh, who had worked at Hanna-Barbera, and that's a drawing he did about deep brain stimulation that he landed up getting that basically cured him. And I, I think it's such an amazing drawing because it looks like something you'd see in a cartoon, but there it is about getting his brain drilled into. And the one on the bottom is Rosalind Fisher, and Rosalind is also a Gaucher patient, and G Rosalind landed up um, going to Caltech and working with them with the electron microscopes. And she does electron microscopy of her hip bone. So when she had her hip replaced, somehow, and I still don't know exactly how because it's illegal to do this, she got a piece of her bone and took it to Caltech and started doing photos of it. And, oh, I thought I had one in here, but I don't. Um, anyway, the stuff in back is a new series she's doing where she got people's tears, and she would let them dry, and then she would uh, do electron microscopy of the tears. And then I, one of the, the main things that happened to me because of Gauthier's is I got to do a TED Talk, which basically talked about most of this, how I landed up at USC. But I also got this talk because uh, a former, unfortunately, she's a former Gauthier patient, um, had been talking to the TED people and said, oh, TED has a good story, you should talk to him. So through a Gaucher connection from our dinners that we used to have in LA, I landed up getting to do a TED talk. So really all the major things in my life have happened because I'm sick. And it's very interesting because my brother Richard, who was the one who landed up with Parkinson's, he would never tell anybody that he was sick. I don't know if it was 
I, I honestly don't know, because we used to talk about it all the time. He never would tell anybody. And as a result, I think he had a much smaller life because he wouldn't discuss it with people. They would say, why are you limping? Why are you so tired? Why are you this? And he would never just say, oh, I've got this thing and I've got these. So people thought he was kind of grumpy. Not that they don't think I'm grumpy, but uh, I, I don't know. I just think it's easier to talk about it most time. Um, and now I've also been doing uh, interviews with patients for a couple different websites where uh, the one on the left is Dominic. He's the one that did the, the water pitcher. And I, he goes in the hospital in LA because he, he has cystic fibrosis and he's had a lung transplant. But when he would go in earlier and they'd have to be in to clean his lungs out, he would do artwork while he's there and then have an art opening in his room the last night before he went home. So I went and did an interview with him. The woman on the right, another catastrophic medical screw up. She went in for a uh, hysterectomy. They landed up uh, nicking her colon. She got a terrible infection, landed up losing her arms and legs. Um, yeah, she got even a bigger award from the insurance company. Um, and she's just learning. She, but she's become a big activist, in not only for uh, help dog or assistance dogs, whatever you call them, but also fighting there's, you know, I don't know what people's politics are here. The Republicans keep trying to limit how much you can get if you're malpracticed, like $250,000. So she's a big activist in trying to stop the, those bills from going through because look at her, 250,000 would have done nothing for her. So she's become a big activist. And the one on the bottom is me interviewing uh, Michael Hayden. He used to be head of Homeland Security and Joint Chiefs of Staff. And these are people that I would have never met again had I not been sick. Nobody, somebody who's like, you know, friends with the president would never have talked to me otherwise had I not, had I not been sick. Um, and this is what I'm doing now. So now I'm happy and I'm doing all these sort of floaty people who have a fun, I just sold this painting by the way. Uh, this is out in the desert. I have a house in LA and one in Joshua Tree. So I've been doing, during COVID, I did all these desert paintings. Yeah, uh, we're Jewish. Um, so I, I will give you the update on my family before I end so they are not forgotten. So this is Richard and I early on before we are diagnosed. And this is Richard as he is just starting to get Parkinson's. And you can see in his face that his face is sort of losing emotion to it. It's also my two cats, Stephen and Stephen, the brothers. Um, and then this is Richard a couple years later. So Richard was a musician, a songwriter, um, and eventually he lost his ability to speak and play guitar. And this, I took this picture not long before he died, but we still had the guitar, so I wanted that. And uh, this is me putting his ashes in the Long Island Sound next to where his house used to be. And this is my other brother, Doug. He's the one that did not have Parkinson's, but he landed up sort of trashing his body. He got diabetes, he was extremely overweight, um, wouldn't do anything. It, it was a big bone of contention because he had the good body in the family, but he sort of treated it badly. Um, so he died uh, in 2015. So, and this is the family, my, my mom, uh, she made it to 85, a week before 85, um, and got lung cancer because she had smoked when she was younger. So Doug is gone, my mom is gone, my dad took the picture, Richard is gone, but I'm still here and I was told, you know, you're not gonna make it to 30. So uh, we're all here and everyone in this room, um, we're, we're still above ground, we're hoping for better treatments and everything's gonna get better and um, thank you all for listening to my little rambling about how Gauchets can have an upside. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Ted. You know, it's interesting. Um, I can't draw a straight line with a ruler, um, but I'm an incredibly creative person. And at some point, I think people judged how poorly I drew, and it, it killed some of the creativity. So pain and emotions can really encourage us sometimes to be creative and to release whatever it is we're feeling. For me, it was through writing, and I know we're gonna, we have a journal workshop and everyone has journals. So there's so many ways to be creative and there's so many ways to express ourselves. And thank you for sharing your brilliance and on how you do that. And I hope everyone here finds a way to express themselves and, and understand where they are in their lives with their disease or their, in their families. Because I think if all of us cannot hold it in and find some way to release and express it, we're gonna be healthier for it. Um, And just because we get older doesn't mean we can't draw silly photos. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to, um, I think I spoke a little bit about the workshops. So breakfast opens tomorrow's Monday at 6.30 a.m., um, but we're all gonna meet here at nine. So if, you're, if you wanna eat earlier, go eat breakfast, come back at nine. If you're more of a late sleeper like I am, just bring your breakfast in. And um, we'll just come here, grab, we'll eat a little, we'll just kind of touch base a little before the workshops. But uh, definitely on your way out, take a look at the board or look on the, the GCA website, figure out what workshops you wanna go to. Um, so we have a birthday today. And where is she? <laughs> and Rebecca Davidson is turned 14 today. And we wanna wish her a happy birthday. And it's so amazingly what a beautiful soul she has because as soon as she found out that this conference was on her birthday, she wanted to come so badly and share her day with the rest of us. So happy, happy birthday. And thank you, um, thank you for coming here and being with us. And I think we have a little gift. I'm not gonna sing in a microphone, but let's sing happy birthday. <laughs> So the family gets to eat the cupcakes. You all have cheesecake. <laughs> cupcakes and I think that's all we have for tonight. So enjoy yourselves. And thank you so much for coming. And if, I don't know, is there any questions or any comments on anything? All right, thanks you guys, we'll see you tomorrow, 9 a.m. in here. <laughs>